Safety Games. BBC News. Paradise on Wheels. That's one description used by a character in Sightseers, a new dark comedy film directed by Ben Wheatley about caravanning, co-written by and starring Alice Lowe and Steve Oram. You can hear what the Saturday Review guests make of it in 15 minutes. First on Radio 4, Rosie Goldsmith presents this week's profile of the leader of the UK Independence Party, Nigel Farage. Our previous best ever by-election result was a fortnight ago, which was 14.3%, and this one is comfortably over 20%. Whichever way you look at it, UKIP is on the rise. It's been Nigel Farage's week. After nearly two decades on the fringes, his United Kingdom Independence Party has been thrust centre stage. It's a bullion leader beaming in the media spotlight. UKIP gave the Tories and Lib Dems a rattling in three by-elections, including Rotherham, where they polled their best ever vote in the party's history. But who is Nigel Farage, the man behind the home county's blazer? Bless his cotton socks, he seems to run on high-quality red wine and, of course, probably 7,000 cigarettes a day. Good chemistry uh, around Nigel. Everything seemed to roll very happily. There'd always be a very politically incorrect atmosphere that just relaxed everybody. He's very insecure. What he does is he actually uses people and he uses them up. He consumes people. Nigel Farage bounced out of the womb 48 years ago. He was born in Kent, where he still lives. His father, Guy Oscar Justice Farage, was a stockbroker, a glamorous bon viveur, and it transpired an alcoholic. Guy left the family home when Nigel was five and doesn't seem to have featured much since then. Nigel bounced through school, Dulwich College in his case, joined everything, cricket, rugby clubs, army cadets, the politics society. His mum, Barbara, told us he was never really interested in toys and things. He was a good scholar. And in his final school report, it said the college would be a poorer place without this boy's personality. In 1982, though, he decided not to go to university, but to work in the city as a commodities trader, which is where he met Stephen Spencer. First impression of Nigel is unorthodox, happy, cheerful guy, outspoken and um, humorous. When I worked as a customer of Nigel's, um, I would wander into a smoke-filled room uh, with tobacco smoke about four feet from the floor with a bunch of very happy traders. Good chemistry uh, around Nigel. Everything seemed to roll very happily. There'd always be a very politically incorrect atmosphere that just relaxed everybody. Alongside work and plenty of play, Nigel Farage flirted with the Conservative Party. But in 1993, he became a founding member of a new party, UKIP, an English nationalist party with one principal goal, to get Britain out of the EU. Farage was elected as an MEP in 1999, and the European Parliament has been his main stomping ground since. The job of UKIP in this Parliament is to provide a voice of opposition, and goodness me, it's needed, because here, everybody agrees on virtually everything. We represent a growing number of people in Britain and across Europe. 50% now of the people in EU countries do not want a centralised European state. And the fact that the EU, an institution Nigel Farage detests, has come to shape, even consume his life, puzzles some of his friends. Stephen Spencer. We always joke with him about that. Um, you know, if you dislike it so much, what are you doing there? But Nigel's view has always been, to me, that the place to be to change it is inside, not outside. He, I think sometimes being out of the mainstream can really change things. And I don't think he's embarrassed to do that. He sees himself as more, more than an agent provocateur. He really does make people sit up and think. So Nigel Farage is against the EU, but not against Europe. His second wife, Kirsten, is German. I'm not an anti-European at all, he told the New Yorker. I'm married to a German, for goodness sake, so I know the dangers of a German-dominated household. Whatever the dangers of being married to a German, it seems she does at least encourage her workaholic husband to embrace the great outdoors. But politics is never far away. Richard North shared Farage's UKIP desk in the early days. Kirsten, his then new wife, German wife, enticed him over the border, over the Rhine, and instead of sitting in a hotel uh, for, for the week, she got a campsite, so we had tents and we could go over there and relax and have barbecues, and she had the kids there, and Farage was there, 
And we were actually having a barbecue, and we had a mat in front of one of the tents, and it started rippling. The surface started rippling. We thought, what on earth is going on here? This was just at a time when we were having enormous trouble with some detractors releasing our database uh, unauthorised. Anyway, going back to this little ripple on this rug, we whipped it up to look, and there... In front of us was this mole just sitting there looking at us, and the cry went out, ah, we found the UKIP mole at last. Back in Brussels, one of Farage's closest political allies was Timo Soini, leader of the Eurosceptic True Finns party. He is very outspoken, frontline. Even the people who doesn't share his message thinks that uh, he's a great speaker and it's, it's fun to listen to. Of course, they don't like his message. Uh, they dislike it. Uh, and uh, every now and then they challenge Nigel. But Nigel is so quick and so intelligent that it's very, very hard to beat him in that sense. But of course, the real Eurocrats and the political elite in Europe, I would say that they rather have parliament without Mr. Farage. Nigel Farage's outspoken speeches in Brussels against his perceived Euro nonsense are legendary, both for their wit and passion, but also for being epically rude and insulting, as the then new president of the European Council, Herman van Rompuy, found out two years ago. You have the charisma of a damp rag and the appearance of a low-grade bank clerk. And the question that I want to ask, the question that I want to ask, that we're all going to ask, is who are you? I'd never heard of you. Nobody in Europe had ever heard of you. I would like to ask you, President, who voted for you? And what mechanism? Oh, I know democracy is not popular with you lot. To Richard North, his former colleague, this colourful side of Farage's personality hides something steelier. Although he comes over as a very friendly, bubbly, open individual... Behind the scenes, actually, he, he's very insecure and he cannot work with people in a detailed, long-term relationship. What he does is he actually uses people and he uses them up. He consumes people. So that when you actually look at his career and his progress, it's a succession of teams around him. People join him, get in him, then see the inner uh, Farage become disillusioned and peel off, rather like me. But there's hundreds of me in that sense. Richard North was sacked by Farage. There's no love loss between them now. In the 2010 general election, Nigel Farage contested John Burko's seat in Buckingham. It was a subversive thing to do, as the Speaker of the House of Commons is neutral and not usually challenged. But on the morning of the election, Farage was involved in an air crash caused, bizarrely, by the UKIP election banner the plane was towing, getting caught in its tail fin. A witness describes the crash. The pilot was still in the actual wreckage. Nigel was, um, there were a couple of people on site who were able to remove Nigel from the wreckage. Uh, The pilot was still trapped inside the plane. Uh, Throughout the whole situation, the uh, the whole... uh, um, ordeal. He was talking to the emergency services on a mobile telephone, explaining what the plane was and what exactly happened. Farage emerged from that accident remarkably quickly. he previously survived a serious car accident at the age of 21, and soon after that, testicular cancer. George Coles, the pub landlord in his local, saw Nigel shortly after the plane crash. He obviously wasn't quite his old self. He still looked a bit, a little bit shaken and a little bit pale and I don't think he'd quite actually got over it at the time, but um, he was obviously putting, you know, being as bouncy as he could because he's a bouncy sort of guy and just putting a bit of a brave face on it all, I think. It's a sort of like, it's a mark of the man, really, isn't it? It's the sort of guy he is. He, he's, a, well, he's a passionate fighter. He doesn't sling the towel in. Farage's friend Stephen Spencer also saw him soon after the air accident. Having crashed his plane at the, uh, in the election campaign, walked away with a damaged back and everything else. He was turning up, still injured, with a stick to pay tribute to one of his colleagues who died at the London Metal Exchange at the church. I was absolutely knocked over to see him, but it was something he wouldn't... And he was walking in incredible pain. That was Nigel. Still chain-smoking. Still managing to walk with... I'm going to miss it. It's just uh, absolutely Nigel. Mr. Hitler, if you...
Nigel Farage's passions go beyond politics. He's a big fan of classic sitcoms like Dad's Army. He loves cricket, but he reserves his greatest enthusiasm for touring World War I battlefields with a group of close friends who call themselves Farage's Foragers. UKIP's Godfrey Bloom and Stephen Spencer are among them. I think it comes partly from a sort of Churchillian attitude to Britain's history and the waning influence of Britain, and, and I think that disturbs him a bit. But very largely, he's, he's deeply interested in, um, in Europe and, and the history of Europe and where it's gone wrong, and he makes it quite plain that you know, he's a very patriotic guy with a very firm stance on what's gone wrong in Europe in terms of um, nationalism. He likes to see the real history displayed and people to understand what Britain went through in two world wars and what our position is in Europe. And um, that and the fact his father took part in the Normandy landings, he's, um, he's passionately interested. We'd been on a battlefield tour around Ypres and the Somme, and we do sometimes refer to them as bottlefield tours. Um, we do yarn late into the night, and I remember one night, I think we were actually in Ypres, uh, and it was about three o'clock in the morning, and we must have drunk the restaurant completely dry uh, of wine, brandy, and everything. It was one hell of a session, and I called time. It's enough for me, three o'clock in the morning. I started to stagger up to bed. And there was Farage in the corner shouting lightweight at me. <laughs> lightweight, Bloom. <laughs> that really sums up Nigel Farage. But is Nigel Farage now a political heavyweight? Certainly he's being scrutinised as never before, as are the rumours of racism which have dogged him and his party for years. One-time ally, now critic, Richard North. I've spent a lot of time with him, watching him, close to him, very, very close to him. And if he is a racist, then he is also a consummate actor because he hides it that well. I, I personally, I don't think he is. As I say, I think he's an old-fashioned, jingoistic patriot. And it's in that sense that he could be regarded as a racist in the same sense that, that perhaps Churchill could be regarded as a racist, in that, that he feels superior as an Englishman, you know, but not in the narrower sense that, that, that we understand in modern parlance a racist to be. But Richard North does have other reservations about Nigel Farage, including what he sees as a lack of political acumen. It is, if you like, part of his persona and part of his charm, you know, hard living, hard drinking, hard smoking. That is who Farage is, and it, it's why and how he's able to attract a following. But if you're looking for a serious politician who is able to lead a party and develop and expand a party, well, they're not the same people. And th this is perhaps UKIP's tragedy, is it has this tremendously effective figurehead, but it has no strategic brain. If you judge Nigel Farage by his electoral success, even after this week, he's a political minnow. UKIP has never won a Westminster seat. And yet, he's one of the most recognisable figures in the country. That's his success, due in large part to his vivacity and flamboyance. His friend Godfrey Bloom just hopes that this high-wire lifestyle isn't his undoing. His lifestyle is appalling. He'd be the first to admit it. Uh, he drinks too much red wine and he smokes too much. And unless I can persuade him and nobody else has succeeded, I don't expect I'll be any, any luckier to slow down. It won't be a question of, uh, you know, he won't have a future because he'll fall off his perch. Profile was presented by Rosie Goldsmith and produced by Hannah Barnes. We've assembled some chairs for this week's Saturday Review guests who will give their verdicts on a new furniture gallery, among other things... That's after this. Any dispassionate biologist from out of space would say humans are a third species of chimpanzee. Tuesday morning on BBC Radio 4. My hands, you might be interested to know, are not terribly good for piano playing. In <laughs> fact, no, that's not a joke. It's true. Conversation with the musician Vladimir Ashkenazi in One to One and the scientist Jared Diamond in The Life Scientific. The majority of historians shy away from comparisons, and history is too important to be left to traditional historians. <laughs> Tuesday morning from 9 o'clock on BBC Radio 4. To what extent do the likes of James Bond and George Smiley resemble real spies? 
Peter Hennessy assesses great British spy novels in tonight's Archive on 4. That's in 45 minutes. First, it's Saturday Review.